uh, now for something completely different, as they say in Monty Python. Um, okay, so everybody's been saying something uh, about Jay. So I was thinking about, you know, so we've known each other almost 30 years now, John, but more than half my adult life. Since I was about 15. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> and I was thinking about what's, what's the same with, between then and now and what's different. So a few things that are, that are the same. So, so the same is we're about the same height as we were back then. We're about the same weight. Well, maybe a pound or two, but it's about the same. Same eye color, you know. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we have the same personalities as we did back then, w without a doubt, which is, you know, mostly having fun while doing science, I would say. And, um, you know, the, I would say that we both have sort of the same tendency, although you might not admit it, toward work-life balance. So family life, you know, having something outside of work other than that. And, and I think we've kept our sense of humor, which is a necessary thing. <coughs> Okay. We'll see you in your talk then. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. And, um, okay, so, so what's different? So, okay, now we both do too much admin work at work compared to then. I, I think we can agree. Um, the hair, color, maybe a little bit different. Okay, I was, I, I, I was a little brown back then. Or the hair, or lack thereof, at least for me, maybe a little bit different. But, so in any case, um, so, so I'm going to talk today about actually the amalgam of, of two students' work. So there's actually going to be two introductory slides. One is the PhD work of Freya Nordseek um, on granular electrification. And the other is actually mostly just from this year from an RU work. Of a, of a, but I'll, I'll show you that next. So, so I'm going to show you um, work that was really motivated by natural uh, electrification. And, you know, we see in various storms the situation where we turn mechanical energy, kinetic energy, into electrical energy, and although the processes I'm, I'm quite sure are not well understood of how exactly this takes place. So we see this in essentially all large volcanic ash plumes are electrified and show lightning. Uh, dust storms then in the arid parts of the world also become electrified. Uh, actually thunder snow is something that I've seen a couple of times in my life where thunder uh, or snowstorms become electrified. And, and thunderstorms, so at least where I am in Maryland, we have in the summertime quite dramatic uh, thunderstorms. And, and dust devils, and, and actually, you know, my, my interest came in trying to understand what's happening in a thunderstorm, and reading the literature, and way too much literature on that, what I became aware of was the fact that lightning is actually pretty well understood. So the plasma physicists have worked out how, when you get large enough electric fields, you get often cosmic ray nucleated plasma discharge and runaway electrons, and they've sorted it out, as far as I can tell, in quite a bit of detail. But why those storms obtain 10 million volt differences across tens of kilometers, I think is not understood. And so we're going to try to probe that, while not going to be able to answer everything, can at least give hints on that. So a very large range of length scales in these phenomena, from microns to tens of kilometers. And I think these things apply not just to Earth, but maybe Earth and Mars and, and the gas giants. And I think to a certain extent, some of the phenomena here are in the realm of collective phenomena and dusty plasmas. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, okay, so what leads to this, uh, lightning that is, uh, atmospheric electric fields. So, so many of you may not be aware that if you just go out into a field, you're actually standing in what had the Earth geoelectric field, which is around 100 volts per meter typically. It's actually continually generated by thunderstorms around the world. And basically the Earth is negatively charged relative to the ionosphere. And so we live in a large spherical capacitor, um, which, which has a variety of effect. Um, I guess, uh, so in the U.S., NASA is actually quite interested and concerned about how charged grains stick to surfaces, concerned about satellites and, and various rovers and such. And I guess in, in practice, flammable powders can and do light on fire sometimes because the electrification ha happens in these charged grains. Um, and, and so we're going to talk about uh, particle spatial arrangements some, but that's actually something that Freya did in earlier work with Raymond Shaw. So, and so here's some nice imagery of a, a, a Japanese volcano, um, but, but many of you have probably seen pictures of those. So and actually along the way, any questions or comments are fair game, so go ahead and wave me down. Now, um, just this year, the, uh, I had a student from the Cooper Union, Schuyler Eiskovitz, who was probably the best RU project ever in my lab. And we had, we had a lot of fun and a really interesting project, but it really came about um, in thinking about things that may happen in uh, the rings of the gas giants. And I'm going to detail for you why that uh, is an issue after going through the experimental work of Freya's first, which were laboratory experiments. Schuyler also did laboratory experiments. All right, so, um, right, so again, thunderstorms, uh, you know, right out of volcanic throats come lightning. Actually, the, the plumes 
ash plumes out of volcanoes typically become electrified. And, and this phenomenon is, is well documented and, and actually used uh, uh, even to, to do precursors of volcanic eruptions at times. So it turns out that actually both aurora and lightning discharges are a thing in, in other planets. So, so lightning is not confined to the Earth. It's something that appears to happen in planetary atmospheres fairly widespread, and, and even perhaps in protoplanetary disks. So, okay, as most of you know, I'm a laboratory experimentalist. So we're going to approach this then by seeing are there laboratory experiments that we can make as models of some of these natural phenomena to help tease out collective phenomena as it may exist, and or at least elucidate the, the mysteries that we may want to have uh, theorists explain. So we're going to have a large collection of discrete particles, like granular experiments in the past. Uh, you know, sand, powders, dirt, you know, we're, we're going to have a variety of materials. This is ex expanded polystyrene, so actually the, the innards of beanbag chairs are going to be the subject of some of the experiments. You know, these granular flows in the lab tend to be athermal in the sense that KTB is not relevant to what's going on. KBT, sorry. Okay. A little jet lag, you know, Mark. You could cut me some slack. <laughs> Less than 24 hours in the country. So, um, although we're going to agitate them, so their kinetic energies are going to be germane to all of this, and they're going to be a uh, large number of collisions. They're nonlinear, discrete, and, and we're not going to take the approach that continuum dynamics is a sensible thing here, that really you have to think about the discreteness. So, uh, you know, avalanches, sandblasting, et cetera. And, and I guess the difference is that many labs, having done granular physics, tried to avoid electrification effects and gone way out of their way to make sure that that was never germane or at least set it aside and tried to. So I'm going to take what is already a hard problem and make it harder by allowing electromagnetics to enter directly and encouraging electromagnetic effects in the experiments. Um, okay, so relevant processes. So there have been research and, and there's literature on this that is mostly focused on material properties. So if you go look at the granular charging literature, it's almost all done by, well, how dissimilar materials, or how's the shape of the materials, or the roughness, or the size of the particles. And there's a fairly good-sized literature on material properties and how they might affect it. I'm going to take the point of view that, that the uh, material science of this is, is not irrelevant, but it's, it's irrelevant from a stat-phys point of view, that there are stat-phys properties that may dominate over material properties in a way that I hope will be clear by the end. Um, so particle size and actually surface curvature are documented in the literature as having a, a role in the sense that small grains will often become negatively charged relative to large grains upon collision. But let me make an even more basic uh, 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 point that if I have two grains that collide, if they're neutral to start with, the odds of them coming off neutral require uh, fine tuning. And so just on average, collisions are going to separate charge. Right? Because if you have, let's say, 10 to the 12 surface charges that are actually interacting, having the collision come away with one part in 10 to the 12 balance is kind of unlikely. Right? So you're going to expect to come away maybe with 10 to the minus 9 surface charges. I mean, you know, I don't know. You know a, a small number relative to the total number uh, actually interacting. Um, so adhered layers of water, I think, may play an important role or unless they're ice particles, in which it's not adhered layers, these are just water particles that are colliding in many of these, these uh, uh, processes. Polarization, electric fields, and piezoelectricity, and a wide variety of other things may play a role. I'm not going to focus on those. Now, what I am going to focus on is collective phenomena in these granular flows. And I think that these actually have been poorly investigated when it comes to charging in, in collective granular flows. And um, so, in particular, behavior at large scales. And let me just posit that the the literature on thunderstorm charging tends to focus on two body collisions as separating charge between water and ice particles in the form of grapple as being the primary mechanism. And I would say that that being an explanation that allows me to generate tens of millions of volt differences across 10 kilometers can't be the whole story. It's the wrong scale, right? So I mean, I can't take a micron size process and use that to separate things to 10 kilometers. I'm going to need a few more decades of spatial explanation to fill in the gaps. Not that I have all of these, but I'm just positing that's necessary. Now, obviously, collective phenomena are not easily predicted by local dynamics. Right? It's a general phenomena. So for instance, um, I, you know, I don't need to actually talk about the details of the collisions to come up with the ideal gas law. I just need some very simple assumptions. It doesn't matter what the gas is. It's not a material property, the ideal gas law. Right? It's a stat phys property. Now, of course, we're exciting these things and they're dissipating. So, so what we're looking at is non-equilibrium stat phys, where things are just that much more harder. Um, 
So, of course, jamming and granular flows is also in that, in that, or swarming or fluid turbulence in the class of hard problems. I think we're looking at here a class of hard problems overall. So we're going we're gonna to make what is a simple experiment exhibiting hard phenomena, as is easy to do in the lab, actually. So the simplest experiment I could think of to show granular charging was to put some grains in a container and shake it. And we started out, actually, as a middle school, high school, uh, or middle school science fair project of my son Paul, where we just had sand grains dried in the oven in a PVC container with aluminum end caps and wires. And if you shook this thing, it would give off 50 to 100 volt discharges just by shaking Home Depot sand up and down. So I, I thought that was kind of curious. Didn't understand why it's doing it. I, I still don't entirely. So we decided, well, that was, that was nice, but not very controlled. So let's do a control experiment in the lab where we're going to have a, a metal end plates, a glass cylinders filled with a variety of different types of particles, shake it up and down using a linear motor so that we can shake it for long periods of time without tiring, and then just measure the voltage difference between the top and the bottom is the primary measurement I'm going to show you. Um, and actually, whether you ground the bottom and measure the top, or ground the top and measure the bottom, or float them both and measure the difference, actually, it doesn't matter. We tried all those combinations just to see. What does matter is what you put inside other than the grains. So the atmosphere has to be carefully controlled. The conductivity of the atmosphere plays a huge role. For those of you that have been shocked in winter, you know that. It's just different when you shuffle your socks in the, and then approach the doorknob or the cat than it is in the summertime when it, well, it's not very humid around here. Okay. If you go someplace where it's humid, you don't get shocked nearly as much. Huh? Okay. Oh, okay. I get the impression of dryness compared to Maryland, but. <laughs> so, so, and in fact, we just evacuate it because that's the easiest way to control atmosphere is to reduce the atmosphere. And it also sucks out the water, which is good. Um, so, although we've done it with dry gas also. So here's a picture of the experiment. It's about, it's, you know, it's, it's hand-sized. Okay, questions about the experimental setup? All right, so pr pretty simple rig. Okay, so the basic observation then is, um, so, so here are the position of the container we measure. Uh, and, and actually, they're not sinusoids. They're length uh, parabola, but they're close to sinusoids. It's just easier to program uh, a step function of acceleration being positive and negative. And what we see then, we start shaking at zero, is that over the first few cycles, we develop voltages that are coming out of the voltage difference between the end caps that grows and we get several volt peak to peak differences between the end caps that develop a complex pattern, although the pattern shape has some similarity over time, although the, the relative phase of the voltage oscillations sometimes reverses. <coughs> so we get peaks at, at, at somewhat predictable places, but more complex phenomena and things drifting over very long periods of time. So none of this is stationary and does not approach a statistically stationary state as far as we can tell in, in some sense. Uh, other than the, the sort of the RMS voltage has some limits that appear to be fairly consistent over time. All right, so, um, and then occasionally multi hundred volt, a thousand volt discharges out of the system as well. So, kind of a regular several volt signal and the occasional plasma discharge, what must be. And although we've not seen light coming out of it, I can guarantee you if we're getting a thousand volt discharge, there's going to be photons. Yeah. Uh, we'll do different materials in a minute. I've never done PZT, but we have some other, uh, it's a piezoelectric. It's the primary industrial piezoelectric. Uh, it actually, I think it's an acronym for piezo transducer, but it's a particular material that's used. Oh, yeah. Z zinc titanate? Okay, sorry. Okay, so we're, I'm not going to focus on the discharges. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that's the simplest thing we see out of this thing, that after you charge a bunch of things, they occasionally discharge. The charging, I think, is the much harder part to, to sort out. And okay, so here's the cartoon of how we interpret our measurements. We have a stack of grains that is colliding with the bottom, becoming airborne, colliding with the top. They're compactifying on both ends. We have a charge distribution within our, our cl uh, cloud of grains, which is complicated and evolving. There are image charges that occur in the plates due to capacitive pickup when they're not in contact with the plates. There's direct charge transfer when they do contact the plates, and then there's occasional plasma discharge as well. Okay, so this is an interpretive cartoon, but it helps to think about the setup. So you, the ground is on the bottom. Uh, it is, but it, it does not change oh, the signal. You, but yeah, 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 because you can actually source charge out of a ground in, into the system. We do not know whether the overall stack is neutral, just to be upfront. At, well, it's 40 millitor, so 40 millitor, you can get a, I mean, you're near the Poshan minimum, so you can just ionize the entire cell. 
And that'll, that'll discharge it, actually. Right? But again, that's the simplest thing to understand here, <laughs> is eventually it going charge neutral, forming a, a weak plasma. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, well, these are in contact with these aluminum plates in contact with the lab. You know, the amount of energy involved in this is actually not impressive. It's not like several kilowatts here. We're talking about a watt, although we have not measured that directly. Yeah, no, it's less than 100 watts. Having shaken the cell by hand, it's less than 100 watts. It's kind of hard to develop more than tens of watts with an arm for very long. Okay, so, um, all right, now, we're going to use a simple model to think about it, where if I take a single hypothetical kinematic grain and shake it up and down, you can, you can uh, just calculate when it would hit the bottom, when it would leave the bottom, when it would hit the top, and when it would leave the top. And those are the dashed lines. So it hits the top, leaves the top, hits the bottom, leaves the bottom. That depends on the acceleration, obviously, right? So we're at more than 1G, so we end up hitting both, right? So there's an effective negative gravity during some part of the cycle. And you notice that the dramatic parts of the signal align well with that. So for instance, hits to the bottom generally has the largest peak. And that's where the, you're gonna have inelastic collapse, obviously, when you hit the bottom and a lot of charge transfer. And um, although hits the top, we have similar peaks. But again, notice that the polarity of the hits the bottom signal is not the same and actually will show reversals, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, we'll get to that. With, I have a whole figure of the, the thresholds for that. Uh, but no, it has, it has to leave the bottom, at least. If it just sits in the bottom, you don't get much. So they have to be agitated. Okay, and this is for uh, polydispersed polystyrene powder. This is for polydispersed glass spheres. We've done 10 different materials. Things actually look somewhat similar. Not identical, but somewhat similar between the different materials. Similar RMS, actually. Say again? The uh, no, we've done monodisperse and polydisperse, and, this, and the RMS is not terribly different. I mean, maybe 50% different. So it may, at, at the 50% level, all of these things matter. No order of magnitude differences. RMS of what? Voltage, sorry. But you said it keeps changing. Uh, yeah, we'll get to, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see, well, no, no, you'll see, we'll get to a time plot of RMS in just a minute. Okay, so, so back to, as a function of the acceleration, right, the amplitude of the oscillation as ratioed with gravity in the lab, we'd see very little RMS voltage below 1G of acceleration. Everything's staying on the bottom plate. The particles are not moving much. Cl collision rate must be low. Um, and then as we go up, there's, you know, we're pumping more energy into it, so there's kind of a natural increase. I think we actually start leaving the top somewhere around here as well. That depends on the cell height, obviously, where, where you're going to do that. So, so nothing very, fairly shocking here. Um, now, we're, I'm going to get to it in a minute. There is a fairly strong dependence on how many layers of grains there are. So how much sand you put in makes a difference. And I've got a figure for that coming up. Okay, so, so no big surprise there. There's a threshold of roughly 1G for turning on of this process. Okay, so now, now with, in, with regard to how much stuff you put in, and this is just one particular grain size, because showing too much data is hard to interpret. We need roughly one monolayer. If we have much below a monolayer, very little ch charging occurs in it. Above one monolayer, there's a, actually a somewhat complex dependence on, on, uh, on how much you put in. So here at 100 monolayers. So at, at some 50 monolayers, it actually drops a bit. And, and so you should understand that this is weeks, if not months, of experimental data taking to actually try to get these. Because of how non-stationary it is, you have to actually do experiments for many thousands of cycles to attempt to get an RMS, which is, is somewhat converged. I, well, I put, I'm worried about putting error bars on these points because of the upcoming figures. Okay, so the system has a very glassy time evolution. All right, so here is the RMS voltage over, averaged over several cycles as a function of of cycle time, right? So this is one shaking once, shaking twice, shaking three times, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. And actually, we never run more than about 8,000 shakes because Freya was, didn't want to run it overnight and was worried about the motor catching on fire and she knew how difficult fires are for me to recover from politically on campus. So, um, and so what we see then is over a long period of time, things just continue to evolve, right? We never reach a sort of level of RMS which then does not continue to evolve for as long as we might care to shake it. Obviously, we've not gone to 10,000 10, or 100,000, but... Uh, depending on material type, yes. Sometimes, no. 
Okay. And actually, in this plot, we've got mixtures of zirconium oxide and silicon oxide, which is piezoelectric. We've got glass. We've got polystyrene. We've got aluminum. We put copper in this thing, and it showed about the same sort of signals, which frankly was surprising to me. I did not think putting a conducting particle type into this could possibly give us the same rough RMS, and it does. So, yeah, it's a puzzle, isn't it? It does suggest material properties is not as important as, one, as the literature suggests. Uh, obviously, metallic particles can still exchange charge on contact, right? They're, they're, well, the charges are free there, so actually it's even somewhat easier to a certain extent. Okay, so each, sorry. Yeah. Each one of these lines is a single experiment? Uh, yeah, it's actually a full did day. It's a full day. No, but did you repeat with the same conditions? How, like how um, possible are these crazy curves? Not. That is, that is you'll, I mean, you, you just go from crazy curve to crazy curve to crazy curve day after day, right? With the same material. With the same material, so with the same material yes. Oh, and I should have pointed out, where you see these minima, those are reversals of the, of the pattern in time relative to one cycle. So those occur occasionally, but kind of rarely. Okay, so let me, let me try to give you some interpretations of the data. Um, okay, so now what we don't have is a camera that can take pictures of charge. I wish I had a camera where I could just take a picture of the charge distribution on the grains. But um, now we could imagine developing a large array of contacts, which we may do in the future. But I just, the students to date have balked of trying to make a camera like upper lid. Okay, so what we did do though is we, we were in an experiment for s uh, th several thousand shakes, stopped it, opened it up. Okay, so these are polystyrene particles. I can tell by looking at them. These do not become damaged. They're, they're soft enough that they just rebound. The glass ones definitely show damage. Zirconium oxide is very aggressive. I mean, it's very hard, right? And so the, the contact stresses are going to be near singular. Uh, so, but what, what's maybe not obvious by this picture, although maybe more obvious in the sidebars, is that there's a pattern to the polydispersity sorting. So these particles have become sorted. Okay. And so we're going to zoom in on the square here. And so, for instance, we have large particles here, although some small, and then patches of many more small particles. Okay. Now, if I did have a camera that showed charge, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to try to warn you when I'm going to give you hypotheses that are not tested. Warning. Untested hypothesis alert. Okay. Imagine, if you will, that right after we stop shaking, there's a charge distribution on these particles that match the size distribution with some statistical irregularity, but that, in fact, we have patches of negatively charged grains and patches of positively charged grains. Testing that is not so straightforward. We actually tried sprinkling toner powder. Oh, gosh, we tried any number of simple things, and nothing simple worked. Uh, actually, measuring electrostatic charge or electrostatic electric fields is actually difficult experimentally because how high impedance the entire measurement is. It's, it's, it's a subtle measurement. Although, you know, you can imagine a scanning charge amplifier setup, although once you open it up, your atmosphere is not controlled, so you need to have that in situ. So you would need to sort of transfer your cell to a vacuum and open it and do an AFM, I don't know. Yeah. What's the of the 10 mega ohms, 2 picofarads. Yeah, no, it's, it, that's germane to interpreting the data, for sure. Again, not dramatically. Well, so, right, so, so, so if, if I'm going to claim size sorting as the primary phenomenon here, yes. Although we see similar signals without that, so I, I okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yes, in fact, a better thing to plot in all this case probably would be charges as a function of time on the plates. We, although we, we think about that as well. I mean, it's just easier for most people to think about voltage. All right, so these are on the order of 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, given the relative capacitances of the uh, pickup system. So we're not talking about a lot of elementary charges here necessarily. Right? But, but on the order of what you might expect from contact electrification of these surfaces. Okay. So, okay, so, so, so the hard part of all this is interpretations because um, to date I've not been able to convince any really good non-equilibrium stat-phys numericist to actually take on the problem 
of trying simulations where we could actually ask all the questions of the simulations that we cannot ask of the experiments. But the phenomena is robust enough that I might imagine that one could reproduce this with simple rules in numerics, I would, I would think. Because right? it's so robust in material type, material size, and you know, many things. Um, although I think I've got one astronomer who's actually interested in doing that. So we may be doing simulations in support of the experiment sometime soon. All right, interpretations. Well, OK, obviously, OK, this is a very vague interpretation. Possible non-equilibrium stat phys underlying our observations. So, so what does that not mean, Itamar? <laughs> Basically, it means everything we don't understand in the entire universe. <laughs> so size sorting coupled with size dependent charging is, is likely important in some of our experiments, but not all. So Tor Shinbarat's actually done some work along these lines, and he believes that the electric field that gets set up biases the contact charging in a way that reinforces it. I have trouble sorting through, I have trouble having his arguments be sensible to me, but, uh, and they're hard to test as well. There are also going to be magnetic field biasing of contact electrification, and I'll actually going to talk about that in, in the remainder of the talk as well. Uh, and, um, and so one of the things we've observed, so we have actually have four different experiments now looking at uh, granular charging. And what becomes evident in some of these is that we actually form particle clusters of many particles, which is uh, uh, evidence of there being positive and negative particles that form molecule-like aggregates. In, in, so the electrostatic forces become as large as gravity and as large as the kinetic uh, uh, forces involved in some of the experiments. It depends on, and that actually depends on the density of the particles quite a bit. Low density particles tend to be easily promoted into electrostatic states where they'll stick to things. So the so experiments actually, all of these experiments show particles sticking to walls <coughs> after being agitated for a while, which shows that gravity's not become the necessarily the major player in everything. Any other questions and comments before we move on? I, so, so, I, so, so, I, so I recommend to you a vast literature of two-body contact charging. You'll read it. Yeah. Can, can you summarize it for me? <laughs> yes, <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the summary. Irrelevant to thunderstorms. I, I just don't think particle type matters as much as the literature suggests. Or, or two contact. So, so as long as two bodies can't exchange charge, macroscopic phenomena ensue. There are hundreds of papers that I cannot possibly summarize. Through piezoelectricity, through dissimilar particles, through particle size, through, oh my gosh, there's a lot of literature on this. I don't think this is a material science uh, a question we're looking at here. Yeah. They're, so they're, they're surface charges. I think you can be pretty sure of that because you're not going to these are not going to be from the interior. I mean, except for the conductors, where, where they still need to get to the surface. So in the case of the non-conductors, these these either must be surface ions that are that are that are rip free. And in the case of the, so so this, that'll be very material specific. So for instance, in the polymers, they have a lot of water, right? Polymers are roughly seventy percent water in many cases. So they're going to have hydroxyl ions and protons just sitting at the surface. Right, loosely bound to the object. So zirconium oxide in vacuum, that's a little harder, I, you know. Oxygen radicals? <laughs> yeah, they're aluminum. Uh, measurement goes away? Oh, well, no, no, well, no measurement. I mean, our primary measurement is voltage difference, so I guess. Although you could put the... Conductors on the outside. We have not tried different end caps. In fact, there are a lot of alternate versions of this experiment that could be done, many more than I will ever do, for sure. Oops. Uh, accumulation of a, a, a small amount of charge on a large number of particles. Yeah, there may be heavy tails involved, right? But again, it's, you know, if you're going to drill down into this, it's better to switch from volts to coulombs, actually. 
Because a thousand volts sounds like a lot, but when you're feeding into two picofarads, you're not necessarily talking about a huge amount of charge. All right. I, I, I want to go out into space soon. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned drilling down in, and that makes me think of fault zones and landslide surfaces and the like, where typically all of the granular material would be fluid saturated. Is that something that's in your thinking here? Earthquakes show lightning. I'm just going to say that. Leave it be. <laughs> Question in the back? I haven't done that experiment. I, <laughs> um, I mean, okay, so my senior colleague, Michael Fisher, has thoroughly ingrained in me, dimensionality always matters. So <laughs> it's likely to be different. Okay, no, no, but, but okay, but but tri but when you say tribal electricity, you're evoking two body collisions. I'm evoking collective phenomena. Do, do, do you see the distinction? <laughs> All right. So okay, so so let me let me posit, if you will, especially when we evacuate the container, that this particle collection actually forms a dusty plasma. So dusty plasma usually means a traditional plasma embedded with grain particles that also become charged. But I would say we could extend the definition to a large number of particles with larger masses that have charge and a relatively diffusive absent uh, hydrogen plasma, for instance. And you know, I think that the, the collective phenomenon of dusty plasmas is a somewhat studied branch of plasma physics, which a lot left to be done. And we started thinking about this in discussing how contact electrification might be relevant to planetary rings. And you know, so beyond thunderstorms then, I want to think about planetary rings and what may happen in those. And so and in thinking about that with one of our uh, aerospace engineers, Christina uh, Herzl, we were thinking about how contact electrification, just be a two body collisions, in the presence of a magnetic field could actually change things quite a bit. I don't think magnetic field matters in our laboratory experiments, but if I have charged grains orbiting at Keplerian velocities, they're actually moving transverse to magnetic fields at kilometers uh, a second, actually. So what will happen is that just two bodies colliding then will we'll experience Lorentz forces that will actually separate positive and negative charge in principle, like a Hall effect. So let's go ahead and explore that idea a little bit, that a dusty plasma could have a Hall effect, and think about what consequence that might have, and then think about experiments. All right, so the basic idea then is, if I'm orbiting and I have two body collisions, I'm just going to have the positives wanting to deorbit and the negatives wanting to superorbit, and they're going to produce electric fields that are radial that then may become germane to the orbital dynamics. And we're going to think about that briefly. <laughs> and, um, and in particular, what we're going to look for in the lab are electric fields that are close to a saturated Hall voltage, which would generally be something like the velocity scale times the magnetic field giving you an electric field amplitude. Okay, so, so Skylar, I presented Skylar with that project this summer, and she liked it a lot. The idea of building a laboratory model of Saturn's rings to look for Hall effects. So she went through about nine revisions of it, and this is what she settled on. So we have uh, a large collection of expanded polystyrene particles. These are very low density. You probably played with them, maybe, when your BMAG chair exploded. Uh, their density is 15 kilo, er, kilograms per meter cube, so, so they're quite readily aloft. We're going to inject compressed air. We're going to have the particles shooting around this. The compressed air escapes through a screen. They're going to come at meters per second down through a test chamber where we have copper plates to measure the electric fields by measuring a voltage across them. And then we're going to put a, a magnetic field transverse to the flow in just a minute. Questions about the setup? Okay, the, the test, this is a 30 centimeter test chamber here. This is all cobbled together from found objects in the lab because we did the whole thing in 10 weeks. We more or less need to find everything we needed either in the lab or from Home Depot. Okay, so, so here now we have large electromagnets in a Helmholtz coil putting 0.2 magnetic fields transverse then to this rapidly moving granular flow with then again measuring the voltage difference between the two sides and I guess we had a poster of Rosie the Riveter for inspiration for Skylar. So that was, uh, those of you who don't know the story, I'll tell you some other time. All right, so, um, and here's 
here's the measurement. You know, within 10 weeks, she was able to demonstrate that the voltage difference between the plates without the magnetic field and with the magnetic field showed a measurable and marked Hall effect just by shooting grains through a transverse magnetic field. Now, we didn't charge these grains intentionally, but they're very evidently charged. When you actually look at the particles moving through the cell, they're in clusters, they're sticking to the walls. They're, and actually, when you turn off the compressed air, roughly half of them are actually sticking to the walls, which they would tend to adhere if they have charge on them due to the image charges in the wall. And as far as I can tell, uh, the Hall effect in a dusty plasma has ne never been observed before. Yeah, it's good. All right, now it turns out that then thinking about this, and the planetary rings, charge to mass ratio matters a lot. And in particular, because the gyro radius will come to play. And so we estimated a, um, a lower bound in charge to mass ratio for our particles at the order of 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. Although I want to point out that that's going to be very sensitive to the size of the particle. Small particles should become more readily charged as their surface to volume ratio goes up as the size goes down, like 1 over d. So for instance, the electron has the most extreme charge to mass ratio at 10 to the 11-ish coulombs per kilogram. Our particles are down here. And so the Earth is actually at 10 to the minus 20. So it's about over here, since the Earth is charged, actually. It's a very low charge to mass ratio. So uh, yeah, so there are charge avalanches. So I'm probably not going to uh, dwell on that, other than to think about what if electric fields were germane to the orbital motions of Saturn rings? OK. Well, it's easy to do a straightforward estimate of that. And actually, I was not the first to do it. There's a, uh, some literature on that. Basically, then, if gravity is balanced not just by centrifugal forces, but by radial electric fields, you can have radial tethers that will affect the orbital motions of the particles. So writing that in terms of the orbital angular velocity, then, um, you know, if I get rid of the electric field term, you just get gm is the Keplerian velocity squared times radius cubed, Kepler's third law. Because I'm using this to define omega sub k. Okay, now we're going to put electric field back in and assume that the radial electric fields in a ringlet of Saturn separate charge on one side, negative charge on the other. There'll be a neutral line orbiting at omega sub k. And the orbital electric fields then actually may end up influencing the actual rotation profile to not be Keplerian. And you get a quadratic functional when you solve it. The difference is minus 1 half times the cyclotron frequency of those particles, Q over M times the axial magnetic field that'll be transverse to these from Saturn. And so I think it's possible that, well, this would give you differential shear in a ringlet that you could establish electric fields that actually allowed a ringlet to rotate solid body, reducing collisions nearly to zero as the particles were no longer under shear. And on either side of the neutral line, they would be repelling each other as well. All right, so let's run some numbers to see if there, this is even remotely possible for real Saturnian parameters. So, so I'm going to pick the Maxwell ringlet. The name sounded likely, so I picked that one. So it's a particular ringlet in Saturn. It's, uh, yeah, so it's got a radius at 87 megameters. It's only 64 kilometers wide. Saturn's magnetic field at the ringlet is about 6 microtesla. So it would have an, a mean orbital uh, Keplerian angular velocity, which is straightforward. But all we would need is a delta omega across that ringlet of uh, so three orders of magnitude smaller, and you could get the entire ringlet to orbit solid body. OK, so can we get enough charging for that actually to be plausible? Well, that's saying, can one half the cyclotron frequency actually balance the delta omega necessary to cut off shear in the system? And it turns out then, just equating these, you need a charge to mass ratio of about 10 to the minus 1 coulombs per kilogram, which for a small particle would be very straightforward. So sm small particles could be readily charged. It's all water ice, it turns out, like thunderstorms. At the, at the higher elevations, uh, it, it's going to be highly charged, maybe. I actually don't know for sure. But what I'm suggesting is rather than having a Keplerian profile, omega as a function of r, which is smooth, that there are, in fact, steps in the profile where ringlets rotate solid body, cutting their shear, uh, stabilizing them and also causing local repulsion in, in the ringlet. Now, it turns out that there's a, a, a little bit of literature that's germane to this, and I'll we'll wrap up real soon. The, um, so so a, 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 actually, a GRL from 1986 talked about how it was possible that the C ring and the B ring were, in fact, raining ice particles down along magnetic field lines onto Saturn. 
And so they only consider the possibility of transfer of water ice from the rings down to Saturn. And so that started me thinking that the magnetic coupling between the rings and Saturn could do something a little bit more complicated. And so, he, so here's, um, here's a particular image of Saturn roughly showing a magnetic field line between the latitude on Saturn that's rotating with a particular radius of ring that is co-rotating with Saturn. And what, the, what that paper didn't consider then is it, whether or not charged particles could stream down to Saturn or stream back, and what is the relative rate of the two. A curious fact, set of facts, Saturn's atmosphere is depleted in ice. The rings are all made of ice. No one's quite sure where all that ice came from. Many people have write about the ice all coming from uh, uh, the moons. Uh, oh, what's the moon? Starts with an E? It, it's Cephas. It turns out the rings have a mass of about the third of the mass of that moon. So if it lost a third of its mass, it could all come from there. But the rings have a mass of 10 to the minus 8 times the mass of Saturn. So in fact, there's a lot of literature talking about the difficulties of measuring any water in Saturn's atmosphere. So how much H2O plus and OH minus have rained upward onto the rings from Saturn, I think, is, is uh, a question to ponder. And, and perhaps measurements can be made, even from Cassini data, in the end. All right, so uh, tentative conclusions, although there's probably more questions than conclusions. So in the experiments we do in the lab, the experiments care little about the particle type. Even conducting and non-conducting particles show similar time traces. And I believe con collective effects are more significant. What those are in detail, I do not know, although there's speculations of what they are. And the referees hate that, having data you can't explain entirely. They really... <laughs> Not that fond of it. But so in addition, I believe that this, these may have, uh, in the case of, of Hall effect on particles, ramifications. And there are ramifications then for geophysical situations in storms, probably not involving Hall effect, but involving the collective effects. And astrophysical situations such as rings or potentially protoplanetary disks with low conductivity. So thank you. Um, you know, Mike, I think that a, a model like that coupled with the kinematic model of them just going up and down might actually work reasonably well. <laughs> just a probabilistic... But, so that would be the non, that'd be the non stochastic part, right? Because we're actually imposing oscillating gravity. So no, that's... then you need a probabilistic model yeah. on the collision of the transfer to the upper and lower plate, right. which would be influenced by the probability distribution of the transfers inside. But, but, but it, I guess it would be a, a, a biased random walker with a threshold? might be biased because the positively charged particles will be repelled by things with the same so, charge, so, but that might be like a weak restraining potential because their inertia is pretty large. So, you know, Mike, I try to pick experiments primarily by their ability to attract talented theorists to think about them. <laughs> so, uh, aluminum and copper have uh, ox insulating oxides. Especially aluminum. Copper a little less. Um, so gold's going to weld readily, so the particles are going to go into amalgams too, too quickly. Um, what about platinum? Platinum might be good. Kind of expensive, but uh, it's we, we could coat the plates in platinum, cut up a bunch of platinum. Might be worth a try. I mean, the copper oxide is slow compared to the aluminum. So they're not, not the same that way. Did you say at the beginning that whether you ground one plate or whether both are not grounded, you get the same phenomenon? Whether we ground the bottom plate or ground the top plate or float them both and do the difference voltage, we see within our, our otherwise time-varying phenomena about the same thing. Same RMSs. And the, well, there was long fluctuations. Both are not grounded? Same or not same? 